Welcome and thank you for joining us for worship today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Oh God on high, give us hearts full of gratitude. We have much to celebrate and we ask that you would fill our souls with a pure desire to worship. The gift you have given us in the raising of your son from the dead is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. We want our worship to reflect the elation we feel. Thank you for being present with us. Guide us as we worship today. Now let's join together in song. Morning has broken. Morning has broken Like the first morning Blackbird has spoken Like the first bird Praise for the singing Praise for the Praise for the springing, fresh from the word. Sweet the rains new fall, sunlit from heaven, like the first dew. For the sweetness of the wet garden, bring and completeness where his feet pass. Mine is the sunlight, mine is the God, speak powerfully to us today through what is written in your Holy Scripture. Help us hear the witnesses to Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and to the promises of life in his name. Amen. So last week, we talked about our longing to become more like Christ, to do all that we do for the sake of God's glory. In other words, to be more holy. Well, today we're going to talk about kind of the other end of it. If, if holiness is, is that goal, crises of faith are realities on the path. You know, too often we see the two linked. Adam Hamilton writes, when we are focused on our pursuit of holiness, we may find the goal elusive and may never be certain we've done enough to see or please God. And when that happens, we fall into something called works righteousness, where we think that what we do is going to earn God's favor. We forget that, as Paul told, tells us in Romans, there is nothing we can do to lose God's love. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Well, when we forget, when we start trying to do it out of our own strength, we can experience a crisis of faith. Now, that's not the only thing that leads to a crisis of faith, as I'm sure you're aware in your life. But as we're talking about revival, I want to focus on this particular kind of crisis that we can become susceptible to, both as we see in Scripture and in history. So there are crises of faith in the Bible, Think about Peter. You know, Peter received this 
powerful vision in Acts about how the grace of God was not limited and in fact extended to all peoples, including the Gentiles. He saw this cloth lowered with all sorts of food on it that were not clean for Jews to eat. And when God told him to eat and he said, no, no, I, I, I know the law. God said, what I have made clean, you don't get to declare unclean. And almost immediately after these, these visions came, a Roman centurion came to him, not just a Gentile, but a Roman. And Paul went to him and preached the gospel, baptized them. The man's name was Cornelius. And he, Peter stood up and talked about that vision and, and that experience in front of the whole church in Acts chapter 15. And yet we know later from Paul's writing that at some point, Peter seems to have wavered, had a crisis of faith. He began backing away from the Gentiles because the Jews, the Jewish Christians were giving him a hard time, worried about unclean and clean. Sounds like he began to have a crisis of faith, doesn't it? Paul had that too. He was a Pharisee. He was an expert in the law. He was zealous for the law. He, he had writs from the, the council to arrest people who were following Jesus. And then he had a spectacular crisis of faith on the road to Damascus. I put it all in a different perspective where Jesus spoke to him saying, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? And he realized that instead of the law saving him, he needed to put his trust in God's grace. Listen to how he phrased it in this passage from Romans. Romans 4, 3 through 5, and 5, 1 through 2. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Wow. What a change. Paul's crisis of faith transformed him. That encounter turned his world upside down. As he would say in another letter, he let go of all that he had thought important before for the sake of the love of Christ. In fact, he called it rubbish. It didn't stop with the New Testament, though. Martin Luther, the one who started the Protestant Reformation, started from a crisis of faith. You know, he knew the New Testament. He knew Paul and, and, and Paul's message of grace, but he struggled. He became obsessed with finding every little sin in his life to get rid of it, to confess them. He would spend hours every day in the confessional, and yet as soon as he walked out, he thought of something he had forgotten and rushed back in. And then he sat down reading Paul's letter to the Romans, and, and a light bulb went on for him. He got it. He was not saved by anything he did or all about the sins he confessed. He was saved solely by God's grace, and that grace came while he was yet a sinner. It was not about something he had to do or undo. Luther said, then I felt as if I had been completely reborn and had entered paradise through widely opened doors. Another man who had such a crisis was Blaise Pascal. Now you may know him as a mathematician, but he was also a philosopher. And sometime in the year 1654, Pascal had a crisis of faith. No one knows exactly what it was, but they knew he'd been deeply unhappy despite his success. You ever felt like that? Like, I don't know, maybe 
you didn't deserve the success you had or or that the other shoe was going to drop or we don't know why Pascal felt this way but then one night in November of 1654 it all changed as one writer put it one day he'd been drowning in confusion the next he was free of it one day he'd been unhappy with his life disgusted with his world and himself and then there was a change in his soul. Now, he never talked about what happened that night, but when he died, a servant found a crumpled piece of paper sewn into his coat. And on it, Pascal had written, Fire. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not the God of the philosophers and of the learned. Certitude, certitude, feeling joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ, forgetfulness of the world and of everything except God, grandeur of the human soul, joy, 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 tears of joy. Wow, that sounds like a crisis of faith, doesn't it? One where Pascal discovered what Peter, Paul, and Luther had, this certitude, assurance of God's love and presence that brought him peace and joy. Now, John Wesley had his own crisis, one that was not just one moment in time. It stretched over a length of time, which, if you think about it, is how it happens so often. John, his brother Charles, and other members of the Holiness Club, the Bible Moss, the Methodists that we talked about last year at Oxford, had, had been pursuing holiness with great dedication. And over time, the means of grace that they'd been using, prayer, fasting, worship, works of mercy, had taken on a life of their own. They had become the end rather than the means. And through them, Wesley seemed to believe he could earn God's favor. Adam Hamilton points out that Wesley had often been charged with being too strict, with carrying things too far in religion, laying burdens on myself if not on others which were neither necessary nor possible to be borne. Now, Wesley did not agree, didn't put much credence in it, as Hamilton points out, too often the pursuit of holiness becomes this slippery slope into legalism, looking more like a Pharisee than Jesus. Have you ever seen that happen? Has that ever been true for you? You want to please God, but somehow that becomes about proving your worth to God? And since we will never succeed in doing that, because we all don't have to, we already have God's love and grace, we get frustrated, resentful, discouraged, and we may even give up. Well, John knew something was missing. So he thought, well, maybe a change of scenery would help. He decided to go to the new colony of Georgia in the American colonies. Now, Hamilton points out that Wesley had a deep fear of the sea. He had never been on a sh uh, ship, and he would end up getting terribly seasick. What was the man thinking? This was a joy uh, voyage that was over three months long across the Atlantic in the winter when there were terrible storms. And yes, the journey he took to America was awful. The ship was caught in several horrific storms, one so bad that it snapped the main mast of the ship. Wesley, he knew he was going to die. And he discovered something deeply troubling. He discovered he was very much afraid to die. That shook him to his core. It was a crisis. Where was his faith in God that he should be afraid to die? was at the end, though. There was more to come. See, when he arrived in Georgia, he set about spreading his holiness practices, and it began the moment he set foot on dry land because he dumped out all the rum that the ship had brought, which was probably a big source of what they hoped to sell and, and make income from. I know that made him a lot of fans. He also started small groups like the one he had had in Oxford, and yes, he had some success, 
Many embraced his practices, but Wesley became rigid and pharisaical in his ministry. For instance, if you had not attended the 5 a.m. prayer service the week before, he would, re uh, he would refuse to serve you communion. One parishioner told him, I like nothing you do. Indeed, there is neither man nor woman in town who minds a word you say. And so you may preach long enough, but nobody will come to hear you. Ooh, ouch. Wesley cut time, cut short his time in Georgia. That's a story for another day. But let's just say it was about more of the same. Well, he's back in London, and now the crisis of faith reached its apex. He felt like a failure. He didn't believe what he was preaching. He was humbled and broken. And one night, after he'd returned from Georgia, Wesley went to a meeting of the Aldersgate Society. He wrote in his journal that he went very unwillingly. And while there, Someone was reading Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans, and something happened to John Wesley. He wrote in his journal, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and assurance was given me that he'd taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That was his crisis of faith, and that night began a transformation in Wesley and his ministry. For now, he knew in his head and his heart that the grace of God had saved him. Have you ever felt like John Wesley, humbled and broken? What crisis brought you there? What storm caused you to realize you were terrified? Was it a health crisis, divorce, financial problems, death? Most of the, us have had these crises of faith in our lives. I had one. It was about my friend um, in Houston telling me she was thinking about taking a job in Seattle. And while I was very happy for her, I realized how alone I had become. She wasn't just my best friend. She was about my only friend. And it brought me back to God because I'd wandered off. The good news is that God is present in the brokenness, in the wilderness, ready to speak if we're ready to listen. Too often, we try to justify ourselves. Did you hear what I said? We justify ourselves. But if we will be open, if we will give God our failures, our brokenness, God will do something amazing, miraculous. God works in the brokenness. God justifies us through his grace. We can't justify ourselves. Our good deeds, our faithful worship, that doesn't save us. It's all God. It's all grace. Those deeds and that, that worship is our response to God's love and grace. We are beloved children whom God claims and accepts. Nothing you can do or not do will change that. Nothing in heaven or earth can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Have you accepted that with your head and your heart? Amen. Let us pray. God, we bring to you all of ourselves, our joys, our hopes, our questions, our doubts, our crises. Sometimes, Lord, life is too much, and we lose sight of you. We enter into one of these times of a crisis of faith. Oh, God, we take comfort in the fact that we're not alone. We're not the first to have these. There is no shame in having a crisis of faith. 
we look to those who went before us, whether it is the disciples or our forefathers like Luther and Wesley. Use them to inspire us and to give us hope, to show us a way and to persevere, to, to proclaim faith even if we don't feel it, to, to pray even if it feels like it's just words. And you are there. And there will come a time, a day, when we feel that presence. If it is today, we rejoice. And we remember those times when you felt so far away and we cried out with the Psalms to listen to us, to, to speak to us. We are confident, Lord, that through Christ, you have claimed us as yours, sons and daughters. And like any good parent, you are there for us, even when we feel alone. So, Lord, be present with us. Walk with us through every dark valleys with your rod and your staff to comfort us. Anoint our heads in the presence of our enemies, even when that enemy is ourselves. We pray in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now where will we go and who will we be? We go out into the world to be God's people. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit accompany us always, whether we feel God's presence or not. Amen.